they, they put themselves in a place where they decreed certain things securities, certain things not securities. My view on that is there was a logic to why Bitcoin and Ethereum were ruled commodities as opposed to securities. And that's because when you deem something a commodity, you can then have futures contracts against it, which then allow you, as Leo Melamed from the CME said, to tame the price. Because what's happening right now is the reason that Bitcoin hasn't reacted the way people thought uh, post having is you have massive arbitrage going on between the big dogs who are shorting the futures and buying the underlying ETF. So most of the inflows to those ETFs are not really retail flows and, and actual purchases. They're just arbitrage to, to capture the spread between the future and the spot. Crypto family. That was Mark Yusko telling you how the Bitcoin ETFs are being manipulated. And this is why Bitcoin's price could be dropping here as of late. In today's clip, he talks about some of his recent thoughts on Bitcoin and where he sees it going next and the future of crypto. So I highly recommend you guys check this one out all the way to the end. Like, hit that subscribe button. We have new videos coming out every single day. Let's go ahead and see what Mark has to say here in today's clip. You know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, maybe Ethereum. I, I really don't like Ethereum much as, as money. I like it as a, as a global computer. But things like Dash or Monero or things like that do have some cryptocurrency aspects to them. An NFT, a non-fungible token. Now, it's not a monkey JPEG, right, which is what everyone associates. But I don't even like the term NFT or non-fungible token because it is accurate, right? Non-fungible means unique. Token means a entry on a ledger. It's not like a little coin or something. It's an entry on a ledger, which is all a blockchain really is, a series of entries on a ledger. But the difference is blockchains are permanent and immutable. They're not centralized like a, a COBOL database that we all use every day with our Visa or MasterCard. If they want to turn it off, they can. Or if we want to store all our data on the cloud, they, they could keep it if they want. Or we put our money in the bank, it's on a ledger, but it's the bank's money, right? It's, it's not our money anymore. And what blockchains do is they, they fix that. They let us own things. So web one was read, web two was read, write, you know, putting stuff on the internet. Web three is read, write, own. Blockchains allow us to own things and so non-fungible token really, I think, should be called a digital property right. All an entry on a ledger is, is a record of someone's ownership of some property. It could be a JPEG. It could be a title. It could be a stock certificate. It could be a bond. It could be any asset. It could be the Mona Lisa, not the physical Mona Lisa, but the right to, to own the Mona Lisa. But that's ultimately what blockchains are, are good for. And Eric Schmidt, you know, from Google said it best. So Satoshi Nakamoto did what gave us Bitcoin, but more importantly, gave us the technology to create unique assets in the digital sphere. And, and what does that even mean? Well, think about it. Think about stocks, right? In the olden days, you and I would meet in New York at the Buttonwood tree, literally big tree where the stock exchange is today. And we would bring our analog stuff, stock certificates and pieces of paper, banknotes, and we would meet and we would exchange and we had to be physically proximate. And the real problem was if you seen gangs in New York on the way to the Buttonwood tree, those guys with the top hats would steal our stuff. So the stock exchange built a building and said, come inside and you'll be safe, but you still had to get there. So they came up with an idea with the advent of computing, the electronic age to say, you know what? Put the bank notes in the bank and let them be ones and zeros electronic database. Put your stock certificates in Dallas, Texas and DTCC and have these QSIPs, these alphanumeric codes. And you guys can change in the old days, physical people would go and, and do the, the bartering on the floor of the stock exchange. Now it's just computers. There's no people there, not no people, but almost no people. Well, that's fine. But those stock certificates still have to exist in Dallas, Texas. Well, why? Why not create 
unique digital assets, entries on a blockchain ledger, and that's the digital age. So we went from the analog age to the electronic age to the digital age, and everything in the world, every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every collectible car, every case of wine, every private business, all $700 trillion of assets will eventually be entries on a blockchain. Blockchains will be the computing platform in which all of us work and will buy and sell assets in the digital realm instead of the electronic realm. Look, most of the problem with many utility tokens is they are not truly decentralized at all, right? They are pointers to AWS or Azure servers. You know, the only, to me, on-chain means on-chain. If I want to own an asset on-chain, I want it physically on the chain. And, and to me, proof of work is, is the best way to do that. So ultimately, I think Bitcoin has a huge advantage kind of the Lord of the Rings, one chain to rule all chains. Now, does that mean that virtual machines are useless? No. Does it mean that that I think there are weaknesses in, in proof of stake and, and proof of history? Yes. Does it mean that they are more centralized than they should be? Absolutely. Uh, what will fix that? More development activity, more nodes, more decentralization. But in the short run, um yeah they are overly centralized um com comparatively yeah so look the, the problem with trying to time the yen implosion you know kyle bass has been trying to do it for 15 years 15 years and and there are people that predated him that said hey when you get to a hundred percent debt to gdp you got to collapse well maybe it's 150 maybe it's 180 well maybe it's 220. well the reality is because of the yen carry trade and what is the yen carry trade so if you have interest rates at zero and people from around the world can go borrow money at zero and buy anything with a yield that's a carry trade so for years the yen was the axe in that that global carry trade which was really interesting because other countries could have lowered their rates to zero, which eventually they did. And so there was this period three years ago where the yen actually strengthened. You're like, that can't be, right? Everything about this country is imploding except their quality of life. The quality of life is really, really high, especially if, if you happen to live already in, in Tokyo. Um, you know, food's great, apartments are great, it, it, it's great quality of life. But short version of the long tail is once the Fed went back to uh, punishing, uh, well, punishing the masses by raising rates, um, or I should say unpunishing savers, right? Because by going to zero, you're punishing the savers and you're stealing money from the savers to give it to the rich because they lever up everything. So once they reversed that, uh, the yen carry trade was back and it has been back as the preferred trade. And so the, the dichotomy is you're right. In theory, a country with 226% debt to GDP should implode. The yen should skyrocket out of control and it should be a really you know bad experience, but the demand for yen to fund this global carry trade, which is encouraged, by the way, um, is almost infinite because the fiat countries keep printing more money. So think about the race to the bottom. You know, everyone quotes DXY, right? Oh, look how strong the dollar is. No, no, it's not. It's just less weak than the yen or the euro. If you look at it relative to renminbi, it's actually not strong. So this global race to the bottom is inevitable because of demographics. Demographics are destiny. 65 to 85 year old people, they don't spend a lot. They tend to save and they like fixed income. And so what we've seen as Japan first, then Europe, 
than the U.S. Every single day, 10,000 people in the United States and Europe turn 65 for the next seven plus years. And that is going to continue to play out. So if you want to know what's going to happen in U.S. and Europe, just look at Japan 11 years ago. And so, you know, they peaked in 89. We peaked in 2000. Their debt got downgraded 11 years later. U.S. debt gets downgraded. Same kind of things happen. And ultimately, I think the yen is a controlled demolition, not a out of control demolition. And I think the yen carry trade is back to being the most preferred because they're the, the place that still has zero rate.